fun. Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. This is Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and this is the web's premier talk show about Gnosticism, Gnosis, mysticism, the occult, literary criticism, society, Marvel movies, the hellscape that is Twitter, and anything else we feel like talking about today. This is another special entry in our uh, mini-series, The Black Iron Prison, where we try to talk to people who are perhaps outside of the Gnostic world, who are not Gnostic practitioners or scholars, uh, about some of the interesting places and perspectives where Gnostic themes or themes that you could interpret as Gnostic pop up in our society. Uh, my guest is writer uh, and film critic, uh, John Semley. Hello, John. Good to be here. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to have you. Uh, before we get to the good stuff, which is the interview, unfortunately, I do have to do our Patreon commercial because we are brought to you by viewers and listeners like you. If you're able to financially support us, uh, we literally can't do the show without a little bit of financial support, please go to patreon.com slash Gnostic, where you can sign up for as little as a dollar uh, per piece of media per month. If uh, you want to put a cap on that, you know, if you're scared we're going to do a thousand pieces of media that month, then you can also do that so that you can save in your budget. If you want to do a one-time donation, you can go to paypal.com slash Gnostic, and you can do a one-time donation there. And also, if you're unable to help us out financially, which I 100% understand, I'm often there myself, there's lots of things you can do to help us spread the light of Gnosis. You can share the show on your socials. You can like and subscribe. You can leave us a good review and good rating on the podcatcher of your choice, particularly Apple Podcasts. You can also just tell people about the show, you know, that one-to-one that -one really help spread the word and you can also take your favorite episode and you just email it to a friend it's probably going to be this episode right so the, <laughs> the commercial is over uh john uh let's see here first question does the gnostic mythos uh, appeal to you in any way like from liking it as a narrative convention all the way to as a lens or understanding the world and and why does it appeal to you or perhaps not appeal to you yeah, so part of the reason that I was kind of interested when you reached out is because I'm not a Gnostic practitioner or really a practitioner of, of uh, anything, especially religious or spiritual. But uh, one of my big interests is like, I guess, this Marxist or Marxian notion of, of ideology, the idea that uh, we, we live behind a kind of veil of unreason that we're trying to pierce. Uh, and I think I have responded to sort of Gnostic themes or ideas or images throughout my life because, uh, and this might sound crass or something to a practitioner, but because it almost gives a kind of uh, visual and aesthetic vocabulary to something like that. Yeah. Um, I, I think that if you're so inclined, you can kind of find Gnostic themes and ideas everywhere. Uh, and certainly, again, those images and ideas are often uh, undeniably much cooler than stuff you'll find in an Adorno and Horkheimer book or something like that. Uh I completely agree. And, you know, that's part of the, att the attraction to me, you know, before I became a practitioner <laughs> um, and also kind of expanding out from the religious sphere of, of seeing these connections to some, some modern thought and interpreting it through that lens, as well as just having this sort of fun, mythical vocabulary for, for understanding the world around us. And, and there are scholars and, you know, I don't want to turn anybody off out there because uh, within my community, we have a very wide range of political views. And I know within our audience, I can tell from the comments that we have a very wide range of political views. But that that said, you know, there's some scholars that I really like. Uh, I'll link them up in the, the show notes that, that really see uh, cultural criticism, which is associated with the left, and Marxism itself being prefigured in the early Gnostics, in the Gnostics of the uh, two millennia ago. Uh, sort of, you know, there, there are some theories, particularly of cultural criticism, that really what the Gnostics were doing was cultural criticism, but but the only language they had to describe it was religious because that is the, the, the water that they were swimming in. So they're going to mm -hmm. use religious terms to describe what now we would probably understand as, as cultural criticism. Um, John, uh, you are uh, you're actually a writer who writes about a lot of things. <laughs> we can talk a bit about that. Sure, but, yeah. Yeah, but but you are you are a film critic. Um, 
correct? Yeah. Pr primarily, yeah. Or I mean, less so these days, but it was kind of my main gig for a while is uh, getting paid to watch and review movies. Um, and yeah, still do it from time to time and like to kind of dig into stuff at a meteor length and not just kind of knock out 500 word reviews of Alvin and the Chipmunks 4 or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh we we talk a lot on this show and we've done a couple episodes and we'll be doing more in the future about how there there seems to be quite a few gnostic inspired films uh and i think this is why just like of our opening question even if you're you know quote unquote not a gnostic these themes are, are quite compelling and make for great narrative construction so what are some of your favorite gnostic inspired films and perhaps you'll I, I have a, a second part of this question that perhaps I don't even need to ask. Maybe you'll just talk about 10 dramas. But many <laughs> of the great Gnostic-inspired films seem to fall into the fantasy, horror, and science fiction genres. So I'm wondering if there's also a Gnostic film that you think people should check out that's not, not sci-fi fantasy or horror. Yeah, so I was thinking about this. Um... And I, I think that in cinema in particular, there's almost a way that Gnosticism works as a, a kind of meta commentary on the medium itself, the idea of the cinematic illusion itself, the idea of, well, once upon a time anyway, uh, 24 still images projected to give the illusion of movement, uh, and the idea of, you know, the fact that everything we see is essentially illusory, uh, and yet we're asked to sort of suspend our disbelief and buy into it as if it's real. I mean, I think the big kind of... Uh, Within sci-fi and fantasy, we see lots of stuff. I mean, I actually re-watched the Matrix sequels in advance of this, which I'd been kind of putting off for a while, uh, which are so kind of uh, deliberately coded to, to deal with ideas of Gnosticism and the idea of a false reality. Uh, Ditto something like the Truman Show, obviously, would be a big example, where I think like the assistant producer of the fake TV show is even named Sophie or Sophia or something like that. Yeah. Um, the but yeah i mean since you got me thinking about this i don't know if this is common but like now i'm seeing it everywhere right like yesterday i w watched the uh four-hour John Frankenheimer uh, version of uh, The Iceman Cometh with Lee Marvin and, and Robert Ryan. And to talk about this, like, again, the idea of Gnosis intersecting with this idea of ideology that I'm interested in, that is a play and a movie where people talk constantly about pipe dreams and the sort of illusory nature of their ambitions and the world that they live in. Uh, also deals with alcoholism in a very heavy way, which, as I understand it, uh, drunkenness is almost used kind of metaphorically or literally within Gnosticism. Is it not right. to, to, to sort of describe the state of, uh, of becoming woken up as almost coming out of a drunken stupor, uh, yep. which is certainly how Lee Marvin's character in the Iceman Cometh describes his sobriety. Uh, so, you know, not especially Gnostic film per se, but again, something that I think, uh, is shot through with these themes of the the illusory nature of reality and of the American experiment itself, and these very kind of various myths and ideologies that people try to sort of uh, buy into, and which help them kind of delude themselves. A delusion that is compounded by a slavish addiction to alcohol, I would add, in the film and in real life. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I think you're spot on there where, um, of course, once you start looking for it, you see it everywhere. But at the same time, there's a lot of themes that aren't exclusive to the Gnostics, but that the Gnostics highlight it, right? Mm -hmm. that, that really pop up in all sorts of places. Now, sometimes this is just a factor of being human, but but a surprising number of creators are, are at least inspired uh, in some part by Gnosticism, even if it's in a light way. And sometimes it's creators you wouldn't think of. Or Herman Melville is, is perhaps the one that surprises a lot of people. And some people have actually said that Moby Dick is a Gnostic uh, a metaphor, a Gnostic par uh, parable. So, um, but of course... Yeah, and, and I was, I was, I was thinking... Uh, I was reading a lot of Thomas Pinchon novels a few months ago during the pandemic, and obviously a book like The Crying of Lot 49, which is all about uh, a character trying to sort of dismantle what might be a conspiracy and might just be a total fabrication in her head. I think that that sort of deals with, with Gnostic ideas. Uh, and of course, that book feels heavily influential on a show that I watched recently with my girlfriend called Lodge 49, that is kind of this Masonic Lodge uh, AMC dramedy um, that not only deals with like 
a version of a kind of Masonic lodge as social club, but the idea that there is a true lodge behind the lodge that we're kind of uh, experiencing on the show. Um, so yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I'm kind of curious to know your take. Like, why why do you think people become so invested in it? Is it just because it's like a you know, a, a ready-made mythology in the same way that, like, Christianity or, or Catholicism or something like that. I mean, it almost seems like, again, when I was watching the Matrix movies, it's like, I was raised Catholic, so that I know that stuff like the back, back of my hand, but it's like, it's almost so cheesy to do straight Christ metaphors or something like that, right? Where it seems with Gnosticism, there's like a deeper pool that you can draw from, or people might not be as familiar with it. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm curious to know what you think about it. Someone who knows way more about it than I do. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a few things. One is, you know, speaking as a practitioner. Okay, I guess I should start there, which sure. is I believe Gnosticism um, is is real and true. So it's it's going to bubble up in all sorts of places, even if people don't mean it to, right? Now, uh, moving out of making a, a faith statement, uh, I think that, again, going back to the Gnostics as early cultural critics, they just have insights that are particularly relevant for all human experience, and they sort of assemble from a wide variety of place, uh, places themes that are particularly potent and sticky. Right, mm -hmm. because it's it's not like some of the the questions that are risen in Gnosticism can't be found in other places. I, I think there's also a time and place aspect where Gnosticism seems to bubble up, pop up, get stronger, be more relevant when empires are uh, dying. <laughs> the world gets a little bit more Gnostic. <laughs> Interesting. Why 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 do you think that is? I mean, is it is it because the veil is falling away, or or there, there's some level of uh, we're coming out of that period of bad faith or exiting the cave to talk like a Platonist. Th th that's it precisely. Yeah. And uh, if you think of sort of Gnostic awakening, you know, the best, the best, uh, when you get into sort of spirituality and people talk about spiritual awakenings, it it's usually like rainbows and puppy dogs and Hey, I'm part of everything. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but I would say the best depiction of a Gnostic awakening is the first, Matrix movie, when Neo wakes up, you know, naked in that goo, and it's awful, right? And it's just, mm -hmm. you know, ah, oh, there's this horrible world that he's awakened into. You know, that that's the Gnostic experience. And as the veil starts to fall away, as we lose our illusions about the world, as empire crumbles, this is that sort of conceptual shift, right? Where the themes of Gnosticism all of a sudden seem to make a lot more sense. Yeah, another favorite of mine, uh, which I think we can see as being very Gnostic, though, again, I view as one of the great films about capital I ideology is like John Carpenter's They Live, where there's like literally a demystification apparatus where you put on these kind of magical sunglasses and uh, the true meaning of the world is is shown to you. And one of my favorite sequences in that movie is when the main character, Rowdy Roddy Piper, uh, is trying to convince his friend Keith David to put on the glasses and there's this sustained rustling match between them. And it's similar to that sort of sequence in The Matrix you're describing where that awakening or that idea idea of sort of exiting the cavern of bad faith is a arduous, difficult, miserable process. It's not this kind of uh, transcendent enlightenment in a way that feels kind of beatific or something like that, where we're being uh, ascending to something and it's beautiful. It's often uh, quite a miserable realization, I think. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And if you look at any list, if, if nerds are making lists of Gnostic movies, there's yeah not even top 10, right? Within everybody's top five, they live is going to be there, right? It's going to be the matrix they live. Mm -hmm. <laughs> are usually going to be within within the top five. And actually going back to Lodge 48, which I have yet to watch, but everybody keeps telling me to watch it. So I feel like I'm going to be binging it soon and probably doing a whole mini episode on it as we were trying to do some mini episodes and some of the fun pop culture stuff. So uh, I wonder how much it tracks, but I think this, maybe this is just a pandemic thing. But when I watched that show, it was just very comforting to me to see people like hanging out uh, in a Masonic lodge, drinking huge steins of beer. That was very uh, appealing to see when you can't actually socialize with anyone. But I I'm wondering the extent to which uh, it, it actually sort of intersects in a meaningful way with, with Gnostic theology. 
Is yeah, theology let's... the right word? Would that be yeah. the right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Especially if you're talking about it as in, in a faith context, you know, right. the theology and also mythology, not, not, not as we standardly use the term myth, right? Which is just a story that's not true, but a, a story that, th that needs a narrative to impart truths. Because if you sit someone down and tell them the truths, it's just not as effective. You can't do it. Uh, it has to be conveyed through narrative. So right. In a, in a sort of theology. mythos versus logos kind of way where there's the the literal truth and then almost this sort of transcendent truth. I mean, this is something that I respond to and I'll, I'll be honest, like, uh, well, not that I have to confess this, but like, I'm a pretty dull, like materialist uh, in my beliefs. And I think that a lot of the times when I'm attracted to ideas like this, or even to religion or Christianity or Judaism and things like that, it's because even though I don't believe in the sort of transcendent element of it, uh, I think that the mythos offers a useful frame for situating and explaining the logos, if that makes sense. And yeah. uh, But to me, at the end of the day, it's all just kind of uh, fetid sacks of meat, sadly. But not so sadly. I, I think that like when you say you're a materialist or talk about this, and this is something I, 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 I try to write about a bit, is like it's a very depressing realization to be like, well, this is all there is. And, uh, you know, all I have is this like stinky sack of crap, basically. Uh, but I think that that realization can be not in a transcendent way, but kind of a, a knowledge that you can find and build and generate a sort of fulfilling contingent meaning in your life without necessarily recourse to the quest for transcendence. Although I am very sympathetic to and interested in that quest. Uh, yes, exactly. And, and, and even kind of speaking within, within the faith context, um, the material we're here in this material reality and if you look at the gnostic mythos uh th this reality is not always that that pleasant but it's where we're at so, so we, we do have to to build and move and live and and i actually you know i haven't quite squared the circle and in the community that i'm in we we have organizing principles uh and we use the gnostic mythos and christian symbols but we don't tell people how they have to interpret them if, if that makes sense so so there's lots of circles that i haven't squared yet because i i have a lot of affinity for for the existentialists and a lot of the first scholars saw a lot of comparisons uh the first scholars in the 20th century when gnostic texts were, were rediscovered, saw a lot of similarities between existentialism and Gnosticism. Now, that, that's partly because that was one of the dominant philosophical trends of the, in the 1950s. Uh, so that said, you know, in Gnosticism, we, we all embody the logos. So it, it is up to us in a broken world to create meaning. Like in, in my version of the Gnostic mythos, one reason that we're here is to bring meaning into a material world that has no meaning right as as fractal reflections of the logos in a material realm which is in some ways cut off from from the the bigger aspects of the logos hey it's up to you to to do this um and uh when you're sort of talking about still as a materialist as an agnostic as an atheist seeing some of the appeal here you know i think a sheesh act uh, atheistic christianity right mm -hmm. <laughs> um and i wouldn't be surprised if, if we saw more hopefully uh some more atheistic gnosticism um right yeah and uh, I, so I, I think athe especially modern atheism i mean i would uh, uh, identify as an atheist i guess but these sort of uh if you want to talk about aesthetic mythological frameworks these sort of uh, imagistic and aesthetic context of contemporary atheism is uh the most annoying thing on planet earth that i can conceive of like that sort of uh Post Hitchens, Dawkins, Ricky Gervais style, nasally English atheism. Uh, it's enough to drive someone to belief, frankly. Oh, for sure. It, it's the absolute worst. And it's another topic I really like exploring, which which we're going to get into, is um, to, uh, I can't do a good Adam Curtis, but... but uh, <laughs> They, they were trying to set people free, but little did they know. Uh, th these ideas about, about liberatory, liberation ideas that quickly become cages, right? And that new mm -hmm. atheism of, of the early 2000s, right? Like, I, obviously, I get the appeal, and I could see how it did set people free. And I found it annoying then, but I did find that somehow it got even more annoying and became, became a, a trap, you know, became a cage for people.
Well, um, and especially after 9-11, when it kind of just became a framework for justifying Islamophobia. And like to this day, you have Richard Dawkins saying, I'm an atheist, but there's no way that you can deny that objectively the Muslim call to prayer sounds horrible, whereas the bells of St. Andrew sound beautiful. It's like, what the <laughs> fuck are you talking about? Like, how can you divorce the aesthetic dimensions of those things from the religious context, you know? Uh, anyways. <laughs> exactly. Uh, oh, before I move on to my next question, uh, going back to to a question that you had uh, about why I think Gnosticism appeals, and 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 part of it is it's just that the mythology is cool, right? right. It's it's metal. <laughs> and yeah. like, I mean, that's definitely true. When you ask, I mean, about Gnostic art. Sorry to interrupt, but I mean, no, one one of the things that like I didn't really think about until you put the question to me is like, I love the band Fucked Up, like the Toronto hardcore band, and they're mm -hmm. sort of have built their own mythos, and their album art is just kind of like riddled with their own take on uh, Manichaean imagery and, and Gnostic imagery and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's cool. It's cool to draw from, and this is not to degrade the theology but uh it seems in the cultural context there's almost that ag element where there's a buffet approach where you can kind of take the things from it that uh you like at any given time uh so yeah that is a band that uh, i mean not super into the i don't sort of go through the record sleeves to divine meaning from them and stuff like that but i imagine that one could were they so inclined yeah exactly and i suspect because it is uh, a little bit metal that there's probably some other metal bands out there who are sort of deliberately drawing from from the Gnostic mythos. Like I, I know, like the last Liturgy album was basically a Gnostic like concept album. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. So, so the next question I had is, uh, you've written about cyberpunk, uh, an awesome article, which again I'll link in the show notes. And it seems some Gnostic themes particularly pop up in many works of cyberpunk. Do you think that this is just because they're ripping off Philip K. Dick, who is a huge inspiration on the genre and who was, you know, a, a practicing Gnostic? I guess one could say, and was deliberately putting in the themes after he discovered Gnosticism? Or, or do you think it's something about the genre itself? Well, okay, so I think with cyberpunk, I guess to delineate those themes, in cyberpunk you generally have the uh, separation of the material physical world uh, either complemented or augmented by a virtual reality that you can enter into in a non-physical way, but in a way that feels, I guess to use William James term, noetic, like as real as if it were real. Uh, so yeah, I mean, why is that? I don't know, but I, I, I think that like with cyberpunk, often the messaging, same with the, even the Matrix in a way, which I think is kind of not quite cyberpunk, but certainly adjacent to the genre, um, I, I think the idea is that the the transcendence of the self is only ever a kind of temporary illusion or a temporary state, and really it's those physical material conditions that we keep returning to, and that in cyberpunk narratives, I mean, the world has to be made better in that physical material world uh, to to transcend it and enter, uh, you know, whether it's the Matrix or I forget what it's called in Snow Crash, the kind of virtual space, or the Oasis and Ready Player One. To kind of live there in a permanent state is almost a form of uh, abstention from reality. Uh, so, yeah, I think that, like, but, like, whether that's Gnostic, I mean, again, the Matrix obviously draws from Gnosticism very heavily, or Neoplatonist, I mean, I guess I don't know. Like, I'm wondering if you can help me kind of elucidate the difference, because I know that historically uh, the Gnostics and the Neoplatonists kind of intersected. Um, but, but, but to what extent do I distinguish that idea between there being uh, a physical and a sort of realm of ideals and forms from a more sort of strict or rigid Gnostic framework? Yeah, they were definitely influences upon each other. They were in dialogue, and uh, as well as Plato himself. Like, there's a famous cache of Gnostic documents uh, discovered in Nag Hammadi, Egypt, in the 1940s. And then one of the documents was actually uh, 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 from Plato. So uh, I think from uh, I can't remember which work. Is, uh, is that sorry? Is that when they discovered like the Gospel of Thomas, and there were like a, a cache right. of documents, and the guy ended up just burning some of them to stay warm? <laughs> the story is he, he took them home, and his mom, his mom you know threw half of them in the uh in the oven to make bread so right uh <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry so, to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, okay, so the, the neo Neoplatonics and uh, Neoplatonists and the uh, Gnos Gnostics were in dialogue with each other, and they're, they're quite similar systems. And we actually have um, 
writings from the Neoplatonists where the Gnostics would show up to study with them and they would basically tell the, the Gnostics to, to, to uh, GTFO. Uh, because uh, one, of the, one of the main differences is in Neoplatonism, there ultimately isn't a break with the Platonic world. There, there is a straight ladder from this world to the world of forms, right? Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately creation is good uh, in Neoplatonism, where in Gnosticism, similar cosmology, uh, even a similar creation story of, of emanations, right? This divine outpouring. Uh, and the emanations does suggest that there's still connections on different levels of reality with, throughout the cosmos, right? But at some point, there is a break, and the break happens in divinity, which is always very important in Gnosticism. It doesn't happen because of humans, right? The break happens in divinity. Uh, and the Neoplatonists hated that, right? They just hated the very concept of some sort of fall, of some sort of break, of some sort of divine mistake, uh, because the divine can't do such things. Um, so, you know, that's more or less the main difference. That's more or less the stumbling block between the two. Uh, and, but, and is that because that, that divinity presumes, at least at the top level, some sort of monotheistic conception where the Neoplatonists still had a more kind of Jupiterian idea of, of gods? I feel like I'm interviewing you about this, but I'm talking. <laughs> no, that's good. It's good. That's like, good. Like, like I said, I know, I know yeah. so. I my my knowledge of Gnosticism, like my knowledge of most things, it's like uh, surface or maybe a little bit below surface level. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of wondering because when you ask a question like, you know, why is cyberpunk so Gnostic? In my mind, it's like, well. It, how again how is it necessarily gnostic and not just platonic like what is what where does the gnosticism uh insert itself and maybe it isn't that idea of divinity i guess or transcendence you know the idea that you're not sorry I'm, i asked you a question and then answered it myself but uh the idea that you're not just like plugging into a virtual sphere but that when you enter that virtual sphere you attain a state of realness that is more real and more whole than you do in the material realm, which you certainly see in someone like William Gibson uh, in books like Neuromancer, where in that physical realm, people are often literally disfigured, you know, uh, or, or have augmented cybernetic implants and things like that. Whereas in the virtual sphere, you can be whomever you please, or, or again, kind of a wholer version of yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's well, why well, I think you answered the question <laughs> that, that you asked me, uh, which I think is perfect. But so I talk, I talk my way through things. So yeah. if I end up just rambling my way into an answer to my own question, this, thanks this for is, indulging. No, this is what this show is for, actually. And then you know, sometimes we have other guests being like, "Oh, sorry, I went on a long rant," or you know, "I, I just worked out something by saying it verbally." But that's that's what we want. <laughs> so some food rant, work things yeah. out verbally. Uh, I, I think that the last thing I'd say about Neoplatonism and Gnosticism is, uh, I, I think. That anybody watching this, uh, particularly this show, but even the the show in general, uh, it, you start finding Gnosticism in lots of places. It, it's just that Gnosticism and Neoplatonism are much more influential than you would think, right? For right. for two sort of obscure uh, ancient uh, traditions, just they, they've had much more impact on philosophy and on the arts. You know, there was a there, there was a bit of a Neoplatonic uh, revival both in the 1700s and 1800s, uh, and it, it's also a big impact. Neoplatonism is still a big impact on religion, right? Uh, the, which which people may not realize in the West. So so that that's that's why you will one reason why you'll find both of those interconnected uh, forms and understandings of uh, of understanding the world pop up, but. But, but they are quite close. We've done a couple shows on, on Neoplatonism because you know they're 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 sort of our brothers and sisters who are uh, arguing with each other a little bit. So. Yeah, and I, I know even in the early centuries of Christianity, I mean, Gnosticism was so popular that it was almost considered a sect of Christianity, a sort of proper sect, probably not uncontroversially, I would imagine. Uh, but there were hu relative huge numbers of Gnostics. Yes, yeah, but, uh, the, the, for, for us, some different times in history, but in those, those very early days of, of Christianity, uh, Christianity really started off as a, as, as a bunch of competing sects, right? So you want to, if you're looking at sort of modern apologetics, well, not modern, but apologetics for the last 2,000 years, you want to have this construct of, of Christianity, one true Christianity, and then people almost immediately making heresies out of it, right? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a construct. We seem from almost day one 
to have a wide range of ideas about what Christianity is. This is even kind of represented in the Bible where you have the different disciples being like uh, Jesus asking them, uh, who do you think I am? Right. And they all have different answers. Right. Uh, you know, this is probably that probably didn't happen. That is probably the writer of of that story reflecting in, in their time about everybody having these different answers <laughs> about who Jesus is. Um, and the not and there seems to have been actually a number of Gnostic sects, uh, most of them Christian flavored. But if you go back and you look uh, what scholars started discovering in the 19th century and 20th century is that the heretics make up the majority <laughs> of early Christianity. Right, uh, and then you have this this one strain which scholars now call the neo orthodox, right? This one strain of Christianity that starts to become dominant over the others, uh, and you, there's a couple reasons why it becomes dominant. One is, is it's often in the middle. Uh, you know, is is Christ fully divine or is, or is Christ fully human? Well, the neo orthodox are like, ah, let's put the difference. He's both. Because, <laughs> you know, some sects are saying he's completely human, some are saying he's completely divine. Uh, so that's one reason, is they actually wanted to, you know, Catholic means universal. They actually wanted to bring everybody into a universal structure. And then, of course, the other reason, even though this is often overstated and sort of pop understandings of history, is the neo-Orthodox becoming the official uh, 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 religion of the empire, right? That right. That is definitely not going to to uh, help the other sects. So, but yes, so uh, Gnosticism was, was, was quite common uh, in the early days. And then, you know, later you have sort of Gnostic sects like the Cathars about a thousand years later, right, in, in uh, medieval France. And that, that was a very big movement, you know, tens, tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people, uh, at least tens of thousands of people. Um, so, uh, okay, so, so we've already been talking about reality and fake reality. Uh, John, we seem to be enmeshed in layers of fake realities, from, from cyberspace to political narratives. Uh, is there a true, and I put true in quotation marks, <laughs> is there a true reality beneath it all? Yeah, I mean, okay, so speaking of the Iceman cometh, there's this great speech that Robert Ryan's uh, defeated alcoholic has in that movie where he's like, I I'm a man who's doomed to see all sides of a question, and every time I reach a resolution, I basically complicate it until I feel like I can never believe anything. And uh, I really sympathize with that kind of monologue because I find the same tendency in myself. So that question of is there a true reality, uh, I mean... I don't know. I mean, it, it, I think there are things that are truer than not. And I think that I actually have a piece that I wrote for The Baffler that I think is coming out soon about how uh, you hear this word existential crisis all the time, but the real crisis of our era is not existential, but epistemic and about systems of knowledge and how we make sense of things and how those systems of knowledge are diverging in such a way that in a real meaningful way, we live in different realities from one another. And you see this playing out in politics all the time, right? Where people can't even agree on basic premises or let alone sort of conclusions, right? Um, so uh, I, I think that there is, as a materialist, I think that there is uh, a reality that can be measured and weighed, uh, you know, and that we can sort of draw a line around it and through it. Um, but I'm also aware that the systems by which we do that measuring and weighing are themselves always kind of uh, beholden to a certain level of ideological influence. I mean, if I think uh, someone who's a big fan of, of the writing of you know, Thomas Kuhn on scientific revolutions or even someone like Karl Popper, this idea that we have a kind of hard and fast enlightenment science uh, that is capital T true and is itself not just a series of very complicated arbitrations, some of which might be explicitly political and ideological in nature, uh, that I don't really know about. But I also think that for the sake of uh, governing and getting along in political reality, uh, it behooves us to try and behave as if certain things are true. Uh, there's a Noam Chomsky quote I like, where he's like, you have to take some things on faith, otherwise you'll go insane, uh, something like that. So even as a materialist and an atheist, I think that, uh, yeah, it, for, the, for the purposes of advancing issues and thinking through problems, I think we, uh, we have to sort of come to the truest possible conclusions that we can and kind of work from there, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you think humans have a need for transcendence? And, and I'm not just talking about religious transcendence here. Uh, so it could be art, 
the politics, right? Losing yourself in the political struggle, the psychedelics. Uh, so one, and, and of course you can say no, right? Do you, mm -hmm. do you think we have a need for transcendence? Perhaps the second question should be, is transcendence possible? And, and do you think our present society presents healthy outlets for transcendence? Yeah, so you mentioned psychedelics, which are something I'm very interested in, especially of late as they're becoming kind of mainstream through this new sort of clinical uh, medical revival of interest in them, which I think is literally the most exciting thing happening in the world right now. Um, I think there is a, a desire for transcendence. And when I say that I'm a materialist, I would never say like, that's dumb and that desire is stupid. And, you know, you should just have a Tylenol and go to bed or something like that. Um, but how that transcendence is configured, let's take the psychedelic experience, for example, right? I mean, what is happening when we have that experience, which can certainly feel transcendent, is described as transcendent, uh, is described as openly mystical, even in scientific literature, uh, you know, you have studies now that are really getting to the bottom of, you know, what's going on in your 5-H2A receptor when psilocybin or lysergic acid diethylamide interact with it. Uh, but those conclusions will almost never be satisfactory, right? It's that kind of remainder, that element of mystery, that circle that can't be squared, that, uh, I mean, I personally believe those are the most interesting things in life. And I, I think that if you want to talk about a desire for a transcendence, it's the desire that I find interesting. It's not the end goal of transcendence. It's the sort of constant perpetual search and that almost innate need for that uh, that I think is extremely beautiful and profound. Um, even if I don't think that there's like a grail we can sip from and then we sort of ascend or something like that. Uh, so yeah, not trying to be a cake and eat it too guy. Um, but I think that there is a desire, and I think that uh, how we kind of conceive of that desire is, yeah, totally an interesting question. I mean, again, when you look at stuff that's going on in psychedelics, when I say it's the most interesting thing happening, I mean, there are people asking questions about, like, well, why do our brains have these receptors that interact in these drugs that are not produced naturally by our body? It's like, well, what an insanely interesting question. And people have posited the idea that, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago that we mankind essentially existed in a state where we were perpetually tripping and then kind of this uh, physically transcended state. And then evolutionarily, that was deemed to be not advantageous uh, for sustaining the species. So we kind of evolved past it. I mean, that theory has been floated by Alexander Shulgin, who's best known as the sort of uh, chemist who first synthesized, or I guess not first, but popularly resynthesized MDMA. So I mean, when you, when you, you're introduced to ideas like that, that. There was kind of a homo psychedelicus at one point. Uh, I don't know how people can't not be drawn into that. You know, I, I wrote an article about this sort of psychedelic renaissance a while ago where I was doing a lot of thinking and reading about this. And I was on the phone with this one researcher who was describing how they sort of do these kind of mushroom ceremonies in a clinical setting. And while I was talking to him, I just kind of like puttering around my apartment, leafing through books. And he mentioned that they use this ceremonial cup that they got in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. And literally, as he said that, I randomly opened a book where the first sentence is Oaxaca is pronounced Oaxaca, which, um, you know, obviously that's just like uh, something random going on. But uh, when something like that happens, it certainly uh, cracks open something in the mind to suggest that something else might be happening. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Um... We'll, we'll come back to psychedelics, hopefully, because uh, it's, it's a very interesting topic. But uh, since you are a critic, we'll get into some criticism. I forgot to actually mention, you know, you know Harold Bloom called his literary criticism uh, literary Gnosticism. He actually saw his, his criticism as, as a form of Gnosticism. But um, I, I have read that, but I'm wondering if you yeah. can help me with that. Like, how specifically, in the sense that he was kind of reading the texts as if they were religious texts? I mean... I, I don't quite get that sentiment. John, I don't either. Uh, so I, will, <laughs> I, just know he, I just know he said that. You know, I, I was about to lie and go on like some sort of rant and come, like, come around to it, but I'm just going to be honest and say I don't know. And it, it's, a, it's actually another great topic for, for a mini episode at some point, if I can find a Harold Bloom scholar <laughs> who can explain that to me. Well, but, I know I, that, but I know he said it. <laughs> yeah, and he, ha and he has written about some of the like Book of yeah. J or kind of the heretical texts. So uh, 
when I, I, cause I've come across that comment before and like, that's the weird thing is I feel like people use Gnosticism in a way that seems imprecise or casual or something like that. But then I also don't really know that much about it to know if it's imprecise, but anyways, well, put a pin in it for someone who knows about it. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I'll link you up with that <laughs> once I discover, I imagine for Bloom, he probably did mean it in a very precise way. Although that is true, right? Like Gnosticism is thrown around in all sorts of different contexts. And I, you, you know, I'm, I'm not the king of the Gnostics or the Gnostic Pope, right? So I, I, I don't necessarily want to say that this is a right or wrong interpretation, but there's, right, right, right. you know, there's definitely some out there that, uh, that uh, I, I would perhaps roll my eyes at. But, you know, Bloom being very precise in his language, I assume he had a very precise understanding of what he meant by that. Right. Um, but a ruthless, a ruthless criticism of everything existing. I would say that's a good way to sum up the Gnostic approach to life, right? Like they, they were mm -hmm. critical about uh, themselves uh, and about all of reality as well as God. So you can't really get much more critical. But we live in times where people are very critical towards each other, right? The people, normal seeming people, if you met them in day to day life, will say horrible things to each other online. Mm -hmm. uh, you wrote a book called Hater. Yes. Why, why should we strive towards criticism and being a hater? Like, can this help us as individuals, as a society, or are we just going to make this whole mess worse? Well, I, I think in my book, one thing I was trying to distinguish, and whether or not I do a good job of it is, I guess, up to the reader. I, I'm not so happy with it myself sometimes, but um, to be ruthlessly critical. But I think that the, the difference is, like, that we have traded a kind of deep, entrenched, thoughtful, meaningful criticism uh, – for a sort of cultural poptimism, which is maybe something we'll want to talk about, which is then augmented by just a kind of trollish meanness. Uh, so we kind of fundamentally accept the political and cultural and media landscapes that we live in, but then that instinct to be critical just becomes kind of gutter sniping. Uh, so I think that that is what's lost. I mean, in the book, I try to create a distinction between uh, being a hater, which is someone with a kind of almost reflexive but not uninformed distaste uh, for, for what is popular with being a troll, which is someone who just kind of does it for the meanness of it and the needling of it. So, yeah, I mean, I think, again, so to answer that question, I think our society has become more and less critical. I think it's become less critical in a meaningful way and more mean. And I think that those are not the same things. I mean, I can criticize lots of things without being like, I hate this thing and it shouldn't exist, <laughs> you know? Uh, and that that's the kind of the kind of criticism that I'm interested in. I mean, I love, you know, and also criticism in a sort of capital C literary way where it's not just being critical or being negative towards something. It's, uh, you know, reading things as if they are texts and, and, and sort of trying to sort of glean the meanings and intents and, uh, you know, a given author's success or failures in communicating those meanings and intents. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, that, that leads in quite well because you mentioned poptimism. So, so I, I guess a two-part question, if you can very quickly just define it for people who aren't familiar with the term. And, and then my question about it is, I, I feel, and feel free to disagree, that the optimism, it was originally a liberatory impulse, right? This topic mm -hmm. I really like that I find to be Gnostic. These these things that are supposed to set us free but become traps. Uh, so do you agree that it was originally a liberatory impulse? And would you agree it's now become a trap? And, and how do we get out of this trap? Yeah, so optimism is sort of a critical uh, framework that emerged fairly recently uh, that basically was pushing back against the hegemony hegemony of what would be called rockism, right? So it's like, well, we don't have to just consider Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen. We can talk about uh, uh, Beyonce or, or or Britney Spears, or especially optimism is valuable because it kind of gave us a framework for describing non-white forms of art. Like a lot of great writing about hip hop emerged. You know, uh, the issue with optimism, I think, is that it tends to sort of like anything, it became liberatory and certainly emancipatory in a sort of way where more people and more voices were being discussed and taken seriously. Uh, the issue is that then that seriousness, seriousness just became this almost uh, form of 
loose semiotic reading. So it's like, you don't talk about Beyonce's lyrics, you talk about what Beyonce means, you know? Mm. You talk about how Beyonce is framed in the culture. And those are all kind of interesting questions, but I think they get us away from the art in certain ways. And, you know, that's not a diss against Beyonce specifically or anything like that. Although she does kind of suck in my opinion. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think that like, you know, you can you can look at so many things that emerged around the same time that were originally liberatory. You know, you think about the internet itself. The internet was supposed to be this liberatory space where we could all communicate, we could form new opinions and new identities. And now, 25 years later, we have like QAnon, right? You talk to researchers who work in studying the internet and media technology and they have just watched this dream of the internet curdle into a nightmare. So I think like all things, once they like once a framework like popism or poptimism becomes the sort of dominant critical framework, it becomes the hegemon against which other things should kind of try to rebel against a bit. Yeah. But staying with this uh this discussion on poptimism, uh there's a lot of discussion and dialogue uh, around pop culture movies, but particularly superhero movies. Um, so I'll use them as an example. So, so say a superhero movie, uh, it, it has a, a black superhero or uh, perhaps a, um, a, a woman superhero, and, and people really feel like this is making a big change in our culture. And some people have said that, that it's actually racist or misogynist to, to criticize such, such a movie. Uh, so one, I guess, I guess, is it? That's the first part of the question. And this is sort of a complicated question, and, and forgive me if I'm, I'm not articulating it well, but if someone feels harmed or attacked for their race or their sex by a critic for not liking this superhero movie, isn't it better not to say anything because you are actually doing some kind of harm or violence to, to this fan who perhaps is racialized, perhaps is trans, perhaps is a woman, and is, is seeing themselves represented up there on the screen? Yeah, so uh, let me put a pin in the second part because that's more difficult. But the first part I think I have an answer to, which is that like, I think that idea that like you can't be critical of like, let's say Black Panther or Captain Marvel uh, because the, the former has black leads and a largely black cast and the latter has a, a female superhero i think that that is like a form of cynicism that strikes me as being racist or misogynist uh you know the, i i think this idea that uh because certain films uh play the identity politics game to draw in different demographics, to draw in demographics for the most cognate, machine-made, uh, unthinking form of art and culture that is now so dominant. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it reminds me of a classic tweet that's like the hand clapping with uh, how the liberal solution is always hire more female prison guards, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where you're, you're essentially just reupholstering a problem uh, instead of considering the problem. So that said, I mean, I've had these conversations with people and I've had these conversations with people of color, with people of daughters and stuff like that. And it's like, I would never say that like you aren't allowed to like Black Panther. And I mean, there's certain things happening in Black Panther in terms of like the Afrofuturist aesthetic or like the way that the narrative is pitched where a lot of people responded to the villains aims more than the heroes that like i would never say to black people like you're not allowed to enjoy this or there's not something there i would just say that like fundamentally because of the system in which these things are made that it is bound to reproduce the same problems as you know fucking the adventures or whatever the other marvel movies are you know like captain marvel is a great example where that was shown as being a movie that was uh supposed to be feminist because it was a female superhero up on the screen and it was like made in collaboration with the united states air force uh which you know, bombs women and men and children on the other side of the world. So if that is like what we're supposed to take as being feminist, then yeah, I guess I do have a problem with that. Um, as far as it causing people harm, um, I'm not one of these people who's like, I don't think words are harmful. I mean, I think that words can be harmful and like being bullied and being mean and being disrespectful and not recognizing people's identities and stuff like that. I think that that's a problem. Um, but I think that there's also a way that you can criticize something without discrediting those things, without discrediting someone's identity or even their taste. Um, and personally, I, I mean, maybe I have accidentally, but I would never intentionally set out to uh, say that you shouldn't like this because it corresponds with your formation of your own identity. 
I think that'd be a very awful thing to do, actually. Um, that said, yeah, a lot of the times I, I see these sort of plays towards identity uh, as a form of pandering. I, I, you know, I had this conversation with someone about Nomadland and Chloe Zhao, who's now making a Marvel movie. Where they're like, well, you, sh- you got to let her get that money. And it's like, well, sure, she can go make a fucking Marvel movie. I don't care. Do whatever you want. But it's like you have to understand that people will lose respect for you and that I don't think that because she is a Chinese woman or Chinese American woman that it's any different from when any number of men sign up to make like Disney corporation movies. You know, I, I regard it with an equal disdain in the interest of fairness. (laughs) Yeah. Um, we are we are starting to to run out of time, so sure. I better get to you know a really really relevant uh, up to the date uh, question, which is about a Scorsese movie that came out six years ago. Uh, <laughs> you, you you wrote an excellent piece uh, on Scorsese's Silence, um, which I will link in the uh, show notes. But for atheists in a secular society, isn't something like Scorsese's silence, like it's just a bunch of silliness who, you know, it's, it's people stressed out about a bunch of fairy tales, right? Why are silence and similar films important? And I put important in quotation marks. Yeah, well, you're lobbing this right over the plate because uh, if you read the article, you know that I believe the opposite, that it's not just silliness and fairy tales. I mean, and again, I think this gets back to like materialism, right? In my, in my belief, which is that you can watch a movie like Silence, which, uh, if people haven't seen it, it's a sort of uh, historical piece about uh, Jesuits attempting to Christianize Japan, um, your classic colonial narrative, I suppose. But what you see in that movie is this very earnest uh, and deep exploration of faith and the extent that people will go uh, to not just spread their faith or to convert other people to it, but to hold on to it themselves and to keep the things that they believe in close to them and keep them strong and to maintain those traditions. And because I personally believe that there is no actually transcendent spiritual dimension to that, I know that the only thing that's going on there is like the sheer tyranny of human will, uh, which I think you I can find inspiring. I think if you look at the you know story of Andrew Garfield's character in that movie, the extents that he goes to sort of uh, keep his Catholicism at least alive for himself I don't think you have to be like oh what a stupid fool why don't you just renounce this people could put a gun to your head and say why don't you renounce socialism or why don't you renounce any sort of secular thing that you believe in Um, so yeah I think as I said in the title of that article that you you don't need faith to be impressed by the faithful Um, yeah, and I get that out of a lot of movies that deal with religion. I mean, I love films that deal with religion for that reason because they sort of show often the extent to which the human body and the human mind and something like the human soul can kind of stretch uh, before it breaks, if it does break. Yeah. Um, with society where it's at, uh, you know, a multicultural society, uh, an official secular society in most countries, uh, religiosity, uh, you know, receding from our societies, and the moving making system being more commercial than it's ever been. Do you think Silence might be the last great film of, uh, that explores faith in this way? Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of ones that I've seen since. But you know what? It, it's surprising. I mean, and this is why I love reading about religion and I love people even from sort of secular traditions talking about religious uh, ideas. Because I remember when the Safdie Brothers Uncut Gems came out uh, and as a goy, I'm like, there has to be something going on with like this film's depiction of Judaism and Jewish male identity. Talked to friends about it. Sure enough, they had their takes on it. Jewish Currents did a great panel where where people were talking about it. But yeah, I mean, I think that will silence be the last great one? I mean, it certainly didn't make any money. So if anyone is going to the silence playbook, but you know, we get like horseshit Christian movies made all the time called like God's Not Dead Part Seven or Heaven is Actually Existing. So there's always a kind of market for uh, Christian pablum. But I don't know. I think that as long as people have faith, I hope that there's films that that explore faith because, you know, if, if you view it in a sort of strictly kind of philosophical way as a systems by which we make sense of the world, I mean, I think it's important stuff to talk about. And I have arguments with fellow atheists all the time and people very close to me who just like don't care, who would watch silence and be like, I don't give a shit. These people are stupid because they believe in this dumb thing. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I don't believe in it either. And I, 
wouldn't get, you know, my fingernails pulled out uh, for the in the name of Christ or something like that. But it's the idea, it's the undergirding idea of, of believing in something and yoking your pitiable temporary existence to some idea larger than yourself. Yeah. That's what I like. I hope there's more movies like that. I mean, we need more silences and less uh, Avengers and whatever else. Yeah, perhaps perhaps Captain Marvel 2 will be this this, yeah. this this great yeah. exploration of faith in, with these topics. She's gonna bomb like uh, 17th century Japan in that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I guess we should start wrapping it up, but uh, I'll end with uh, with a question about psychedelics, as we promise to come back to it. Yeah, sure. Apart from religion or God, like psychedelics seem to like outside of those those kind of specific tight concepts. Obviously, mm -hmm. there's lots of ways to define God. Uh, uh, the psychedelics seem to induce uh, an experience or a sense of sacredness. Mm -hmm. uh, is this just an illusion caused by the drugs or is it actually revealing something there? Well, I don't know. Um, I, and to the extent that it's an illusion, again, if you think about that notion of noesis where it's like, well, if it feels real, then it is real. And a lot of these sort of revelations or insights that people have, especially as these drugs are used in a contemporary clinical context, are certainly real. So I would never say that the experiences that people have are not real in a meaningful way. Are they real in the way that this best ant ever coffee mug is real? I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that the way we talk about psychedelics is a difficult because as everyone who's done them or written seriously about them knows, it's impossible to sort of describe it without falling into twaddle, which is the word that Elvis Huxley used quite correctly. Um, because yeah, to like have a 14 hour acid trip and come out and be like, love is the fundamental guiding principle of the universe. Like you sound like a greeting card. There's no doubt about it. But you know, a lot of that is just the conditioned cynicism of our own age where why shouldn't we take something like that as being meaningful that that love is a sort of uh, actual energy or sentiment that can kind of guide us. So yes, I mean, there's certain experiences you have on certain psychedelics. I mean, I would never confess to using illicit substances, but I mean, people talk about the DMT experience in particular as if you, you are sort of transported to a place that feels familiar, that feels like you're whole or that you've been there before. Um, you know, I think that that's probably just a very complicated biochemical reaction going on in your brain. Um, but that said, I don't think that revelations that are stimulated by uh, neurochemical and biochemical reactions should be totally discounted. Um, and also the reality is a lot of the ways that we talk about these things, we sort of fall back on recourse to, to notions of God and sacredness, sacred knowledge, the God particle. We sort of use these things because we don't have another vocabulary for describing them. Right. So as someone who writes about this stuff, I'm always sort of interested in that idea of how do we describe or outline an experience like this, you know, without recourse to just like uh, the scientific neurological descriptions and without necessarily recourse to existent canonical religious descriptions. But it's a very uh, difficult problem, you know. Um, because God is a very useful idea and godliness and sacredness and the notion of the mystical. Uh, they obviously pre-exist the words that were created to describe them or the ideas of them pre-exist those words. So trying to create new words after the fact may be a bit redundant. Uh, does that answer the question? 100%. <laughs> okay, unfortunately, we, we, we do have to end, but it's been fantastic, John. And uh, I guess before we go, uh, we could do some plugs. So if you want to tell people, you know, uh, about some projects and where they can find you and all that good stuff. Yeah, and actually, this I should have brought this up with Poptimism, but I worked on a TV show that's now airing on CTV in Canada called This Is Pop. It's a music documentary series uh, that looks at sort of uh, great moments and ideas in pop music. Um, where very interesting for me is someone with a raucous bias where it's like write about ABBA and Swedish pop music. I'm like, what? I don't care about this stuff. Uh, but I end up finding it deeply interesting and hopefully can convey that interest to the viewer. Uh, or check me out on Twitter, John Semley 3000 where I am uh, extremely annoying and online at all times. 
as you can attest. Yes. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would say definitely uh, definitely follow John on Twitter if you're already on Twitter. If you're not on Twitter, don't go don't on Twitter and just Twitter. don't poison your brain that way. Why do we do this to ourselves, John? Like, why, why am I on that hell site every day? I don't know. I've managed to get myself off every other social media site and have resisted joining other ones. But... Uh, yeah, Twitter. There's something about that. Uh, my one of my favorite in quote stories is about the bass player Jacko Pastorius, who had a kind of death wish and used to go around getting bouncers to beat the shit out of him. Uh, and I feel like that impulse is alive in me when I'm on Twitter. It's like I just hate everything that I'm seeing. Uh, yeah. But if you mute all the most annoying people and only listen to funny and smart people, it can be kind of enjoyable. Precisely, precisely. Yeah, just um, uh, I, I do some some volunteer chaplaincy uh, at, at, at McGill, and I, I, I hang and talk with the youngins, and to express how old I am, I tell them, I'm so old, I remember when the internet was fun. I remember when Twitter was fun. That's how ancient I am. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I got a couple plugs here before we wrap up for all you people at home. Uh, MyLandMeditation.substack.com. I do uh, free, secular, open, uh, psychology-based meditation uh, online every Sunday morning, 11 a.m. Montreal time. It's Eastern Standard Time. It's free. It's good for both beginners and experienced meditators. We do an hour, and it's a combination of a few different uh, uh, techniques, both guided and silent. So if you're scared about meditation, for an hour you know we have some breaks we flow through a few different techniques a uh, great group of people come uh check that out anytime every sunday 11 a.m you can sign up for the sub stack uh, and which is basically just the weekly schedule which is always the same uh also you can i have my parish in montreal normally we meet in person but we are doing online meetings every second sunday in the evening 7 p.m eastern standard time again this is more of a meditation night because of sort of the online uh, uh, opportunities we have. You know, in person, we also do some meditation, but more through a specific Gnostic lens. This is uh, meditation and then, you know, discussions on Gnostic themes afterwards. So feel free to, to check that out uh, as long as we're, we're doing it online. So uh, that's it, John. Thanks again. Uh, it, it's been just incredible having you on. Thanks and for having me. And, and I, I learned a lot, too. And I'm sure I'll be seeing uh, Gnostic everything everywhere. What's that condition? Uh, Apothea or whatever, where uh, you, you feel like you see signs of the same thing everywhere. Uh, I'm sure I'll be suffering from that for the next little while. <laughs> I would, the, everybody in sort of my circles has, has, that, has, that, has that Gnostic brain. <laughs> where mm -hmm. It's like, am I reading it into it? Or is it actually there? Or am I having some sort of uh, mental uh, break with reality? Um, okay. Uh, goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye now. Bye.